Well, welcome to Intro to Vegetable Gardening, Part 1. Again, my name is Benton Murphy. I'm a Fall 22 Master Gardener intern. I'm going to be facilitating today's session. I am, again, joined here by my fellow 22 intern, Caitlin Garlow, who's going to be manning the chat box today. Caitlin and I are really particularly thrilled to be doing this with you all today because it's sort of a Fall 2022 Master Gardener intern reunion. We are joined here by two fabulous ladies, Fatima Muhammad and Kristen Moon, who are going to be giving us all the information we need about Vegetable Gardening 101. This is a two-part series, so the next part of Intro to Vegetable Gardening Part 2 is going to be next Friday morning. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you just a little bit more about our wonderful speakers here today and then pass the baton off to them. Fatima Muhammad grew up in New York and moved to the area to work in education policy. She's been an avid gardener for as long as she can remember and currently maintains a plot in the organic Chincapin Community Garden in the city of Alexandria. She's passionate about household plants, vegetables, herbs, and native plants. I share a lot of those interests with you, Fatima. Um, from having grapevines in her backyard in New York to teaching her children how to garden and produce excellent vegetable crops in Georgia and bartering hot peppers with her neighbor in Trinidad, she's had the opportunity to grow multiple types of plants throughout her life in various climates and conditions. However, her love for her native Caribbean cuisine has always shaped what she chooses to grow. Her garden expresses that culture and feels like a little piece of home. Uh, Fatima is joined by uh, our wonderful friend and colleague, Kristen Moon, who started vegetable gardening as a young child. Her family had taught her the importance of self-provisioning, and both her mother and grandmother canned fruits and vegetables every summer. When she moved to Virginia in 2007, she was finally able to turn to her roots, so to speak, and start a small vegetable garden of her own. And while she does not have time for canning, she does like to freeze the products of her labor and give it to her neighbors and friends. Her love of vegetable gardening has influenced her day job as well. She's a professor of history and American studies and teaches classes on American food. For the first time next fall, she's going to be teaching a global history through food class as well. It sounds really cool. Really looking forward to the presentation that you all will both be sharing with us today. So with that, Kristen, I'll hand it over to you. Ben, thank you so much for that introduction and for laying out a roadmap, so to speak, for our presentation today and then, of course, on Friday of next week. So without further ado, let's get into the nuts and bolts of vegetable gardening. Now, for most of us, when we think about vegetable gardening, we think about it in terms of its personal benefits for us, getting us outside, relaxing, maybe some exercise, getting away from our computers, which of course, we're on right now talking about the vegetable gardening, thinking about the nutritional benefits, the diversity that we can grow that you can't have or find in a grocery store, quite frankly, even a farmer's market. But there are also broader benefits to vegetable gardening, particularly here in Northern Virginia in places like Arlington and Alexandria. First and foremost, it makes our neighborhoods beautiful. It adds lush flowers and plants and greenery. It increases our biomass for our little insect and fuzzy friends that live with us in this area. It promotes locally grown fruits and vegetables, gets us away from massive infrastructure and transportation, which we have learned are critical for, for many of these fruits and vegetables that we consume. And of course, it diversifies what we consume. The types of peppers or tomatoes that you can grow in your garden, you'll never find in your local grocery store. So with that sort of big picture sort of discussion, I want to talk a little bit about what we're going to cover today. And our, this is a seven-part presentation. We're going to cover the first four today and the last three on uh, Friday of next week. There are breaks throughout, so we'll have some time to sort of digest, so to speak, uh, what we have covered and to answer answer any questions that might pop up in the chat. I will be covering location and physical requirements, and Fatima will be covering garden layout, seeds, plants, equipment, and supplies. Step one, location. Here in Northern Virginia, there are lots of different options in terms of locations. If this is your first time doing vegetable gardening, probably the most pragmatic thing for you to do is to think about containers. Containers can be very affordable. You can use recycled materials that you've picked up from you know, the grocery store. I like to use gallon uh, buckets that I've gotten from Home Depot, things like that you can use. So you don't have to spend a lot of money and it's manageable. Containers, of course, you can use in almost any type of setting, preferably outdoors, but you can grow some, especially herbs, inside your home as well. 
There are lots of different options in terms of balconies and patios. You can also do, of course, window boxes. These are all spaces that are pretty typical in terms of the homes we have here in Northern Virginia. Vertical wall planters are some really cool creative ways in which you can grow your fruits and vegetables, especially if you have a nice sunny wall. Raised beds if you have a backyard or even a front yard. You can mix it in with other plants that you already have. And of course, if you don't have access to these spaces, there are lots of community spaces that are available. Community gardens are run through our Department of Rec uh, in both Arlington and Alexandria, but also we are seeing apartment complexes and religious institutions offering up spaces where people can do gardening as well. In addition to that, we have to think about site selection. You have to find a space that is convenient to you. If you have to drive 30 minutes to go to your garden site, well, that's probably too far away. Quite frankly, especially during the harvest time when you might wanna stop by your garden once a day or even maybe twice a day, you're not gonna be able to do that if you have to travel long distances. In addition, you'll want an area that is fairly level. This will help the plants grow upright, but also access nutrients, especially water. If it's not level, that water might actually just roll on by, especially if we have a heavy rainstorm like what we do here in Northern Virginia. Sunlight, too much wind, drainage issues, all of these things you need to think about when you choose your garden. If you have too much sunlight or if it's next to a wall where it's really hot, that might not be good for certain plants. If it's too windy, it might knock them over. And if water just sits in a certain spot, that might not be a great spot either. Soil viability is also something you should think about. This area has been used in a lot of different ways. Some areas actually were industrial spaces. Some of these spaces were our former agricultural locations. And you don't know what might be in that soil that could adversely impact you. So things like, for example, heavy metal in some of our industrial spaces. Trees, shrubs, and buildings also can adversely affect a vegetable garden by competing for resources, causing more shade, and also, especially with buildings, uh, if there is things like lead paint on your windowsills, that might flake, that could go into your garden as well. So takeaways from section one, think about your site options. If you're really a first time gardener, think small, think containers, something really manageable that you can be successful with. And then also think about what type of space you have access to and some of these very specific issues. Step two, physical requirements. Now we're literally gonna get down into the nitty gritties. One of the first things that you have to have for a successful vegetable garden is healthy soil. And there are four main components to healthy soil. Loam, which I'll talk about what that is in a moment. Organic material, usually acquired through either compost or manure, air and water. So first, what is loam? Loam is a term that gardeners frequently throw around describing their healthy soil. It actually is tied to texture, as well as the ability of a soil to hold water and have space for air. All of this works together to allow plants to access nutrients in that soil. Typically, loam is a mixture of clay, sand, and silt. And here you can see on the slide some of the ratios or percentages of each. If you're in Northern Virginia, you're going to find that you have heavily clay soil. That's great for holding water, but it's not necessarily great for other things. And so oftentimes we have to amend our soil in order to make sure that we have the most successful garden possible. One of the things tied to that clay soil is friability. Now, friability is basically whether or not your soil is sort of loose enough to sort of crumble in your hand, but yet hold some water. So you want sort of this perfect equilibrium. And the way to figure out whether or not your soil is sort of that perfect equilibrium is either the ball test, which is you take a pile of dirt, you sort of clump it up. And if it holds like a baseball, well, then it's probably a little too dense, or you can do a ribbon test. 
This is when you can put the soil between your thumb and your finger and squeeze that soil between those fingers. And if you can make more than an inch of ribbon, then you probably have some pretty dense soil, which is holding potentially too much water. One of the easiest ways to solve that is to add compost. Another issue that impacts our soil is also compaction. Compaction is basically when the air pockets between the granulars in your soil are either non-existent or too small to allow nutrients and water to move through. This is usually tied to foot traffic or the moving of heavy equipment, but also if you have clay soils, compaction is quite common. So this is something that's a big issue here in Northern Virginia. The best way to check to see if you have compacted soil is to do the garden fork test. That is simply to put a garden fork into your soil. If it goes in quite easily, then you don't have compacted soil. If you have to sort of push on it or jump on like a pitchfork to get it into the dirt, then you probably have compacted soil. The way to resolve that is to turn over the soil using a shovel or add compost. You'll notice we say add compost quite a bit, quite frankly. Another important aspect of understanding your soil is to do a soil test. This is something that master gardeners promote quite a bit. Soil tests give us a lot of important information about what is good and what is not in our soil. And it provides guidance in terms of what types of fertilizer and other amendments that we should be adding to our soil that will produce the best fruits and vegetables that we desire. In addition, it also provides guidance so that we do not over fertilize, which can cause environmental issues too. So how to get a soil test. You can pick it up at any of these locations listed here on the screen. It will be a little box and then a piece of paper that you'll need to fill out. And to do the soil test, you're gonna collect some soil, ideally get a bucket and scoop out 10 sort of spots in your garden that you're interested in testing, put it in the bucket, mix it up, remove any plant matter, rocks or mulch, and then put it to the top in the box. Uh, do not tape the box. That's our PSA for the soil test. And then there is a label on it and you can send it to that address. With the form, they will have your email address and they will send you the results. This is the form. So the form is very straightforward. You have your personal information on the top. You'll let them know the date of when you took the sample. You're gonna give them a sample identification. The easiest is your last name. And then if you run out or like me, moon, it's four letters. You can put a number at the end. You'll use plant to be grown, and for that, you choose a code on the right. And if you've done a Lyme application, they want to have information about that too. And then finally, at the very bottom, there are different types of tests. We mostly recommend a routine one that will tell you what nutrients are in your soil, as well as the ability of that soil to release those nutrients to your plants. So this is what a report looks like. This is actually my report that I did this fall. And there are a couple things that I wanna point out. So the first row tells you about the history of the garden. So if I had done a test before, then it would show some information about that. The middle row is uh, the list of the nutrients in my soil and whether or not they are sufficient for in this case, this was a landscape garden, but if you have a vegetable garden or azaleas or orchards, you would have different numbers and different ratings. So the ratings are pretty straightforward. H is high and moderate, sufficient, etc. The last is tied to some of the chemistry of your soil and its ability to release those nutrients to your plants. So soil pH is actually an, an important indicator in terms of how uh, your plants can access those nutrients. If you have a clay soil, more than likely you have a more acidic soil and that you're going to want to increase the pH to something more neutral. What's interesting here, and I don't know how I pulled this off, is my soil, which is a clay soil, apparently has a pH of 7.2, which is an alkaline soil. That also means that the next number, which is the buffer index, that's the algorithm that soil scientists use to tell would-be gardeners how much lime to apply. I don't actually need to apply any lime. And you can see that at the bottom where they have the recommendations. 6.6 .6 means no lime needed. The other items here, 
catch and exchange capacity, acidity basic, and some of the elements here, this is all tied to access to those nutrients. Particularly the CEC is used to figure out whether or not your plants will be able to get those elements and to use them. That number needs to be higher for me. So over 20 would have been awesome. And as a result, because of what number I have, you can see that there is at the bottom a fertilizer recommendation, a particular ratio, and then a particular type of fertilizer, a 10-10-10 fertilizer. So what is a 10-10-10 fertilizer? So 10-10-10 is a reference to a ratio of three elements, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. There are lots of different fertilizers out there that have different ratios depending on what you need. There's also complete and incomplete fertilizers. Incomplete fertilizers means that they have one or two of these components. And again, it depends on what you're growing and what your soil needs are. There are also special purpose fertilizers. So for example, if you have acid loving plants, you're going to use something very particular for those plants. Slow release is something to think about too. When you apply fertilizer, you're going to see a lot of rapid growth early on, but if that's not your goal, then you might wanna think about something that is a slow release fertilizer. And finally, there's also organic options. For example, there are fertilizers made of ground uh, fish bits, which it's kind of smelly, but is a good alternative. And there's also sludge from human waste that is available on the market too. In addition to that, it's also important to recognize the environmental issues related to fertilizer and that we need to do due diligence to protect our waterways. So when you apply fertilizer, try to avoid any sort of rivers or streams, impervious surfaces such as patios, driveways, walkways, steep hills, where if we have a big storm, the water will just wash that fertilizer away. All of these things are something to be cognizant of. In terms of when to fertilize, every plant is different. So you should look for guidelines on best practices for that plant. In general, you want to apply fertilizer between April and October because you don't want to fertilize when the ground is frozen or close to frozen because then the fertilizer actually can't get into the ground. And finally, there are different types of fertilizer practices. You can broadcast it broadly. You can put it in strips. There are liquid versions. There are ones that you can apply to leaves, all of which are wonderful options for us. The one thing to think about though, is that fertilizer can burn seeds or the roots of seedlings. And so you wanna make sure that you have enough space around those plants. That was a lot on soil. Now let's talk about other requirements for your garden. Sunlight is a critical one. Most people think though that you need full sun for a vegetable garden. And while that is true for some fruits and vegetables, it's not true for all of them. In general, full sun is six to eight hours of direct sunlight. And that's critical for some of our warm season fruits and vegetables, our tomatoes and peppers, et cetera. But some of our leafy greens, some of our cool weather items, those actually can survive quite well with partial sun or partial shade, depending on if you're a half glass full, half glass empty sort of person. There are no vegetables or fruit that I know of that will grow in shade, which is less than four hours of direct sunlight. In addition to sunlight, it's also important to think of large aggregate data about climate. This correlates to what we call plant hardiness scales or plant hardiness. This is a map generated by the USDA for the northeastern part of the United States, which interestingly enough includes Virginia. We are considered 7B on this map, which sort of gives you sort of a, a general range of temperature, but also when our first freeze and our last frost will be. That said, you need to pay attention to microclimates that depending on where you live, you might be a more of a 7A or even a 6B if you are just colder or have more wind, et cetera. And if you have a lot of buildings around you, a lot of poured concrete, you might be tipping towards eight. So something to really think about in terms of how your environment impacts your climate. 
In addition to climate, temperature is also important, especially in terms of what we call cool and warm weather crops. Cool crops are ones that can handle frosts and often thrive in cooler temperatures. Those are the ones that we will be planting probably in March, maybe April. With the weather we're having, I don't know, I'm ready to plant them right now. Um, so we'll see. If it gets hot though, these plants tend to do something called bolting. Namely, they shoot up some flowers and all of the energy within those plants goes towards those flowers and not necessarily to the leafy greens that we will want to eat. So so it's something to be very careful of with especially our leafy greens. Warm season crops, these are ones that are really negatively affected by cool temperatures. They don't tend to thrive under 50 and they will be killed by a frost. That said, they also don't necessarily do well in really hot temperatures. So over 90, you will see things like your tomatoes and peppers kind of slow down a little bit. They're not going to be as productive as they are when it's in the 70s and 80s. So there is a sort of a sweet spot, so to speak, for our warm weather crops as well. Air is also important. Air is important in a bunch of different ways. So first and foremost, it's a component of our soil. About 25% of your soil will be air. And that air helps to facilitate the movement of both nutrients and water, both of which, of course, your plants need. In addition to what's going on in the dirt, we also need to think about air around your plants. If it is windy, that has the potential of knocking over plants and affecting how they grow. But also if your plants are too crowded, then you don't have proper airflow around those plants and that can also lead to diseases, which we'll be talking about next week. Water is also a critical requirement. And here in front of you is actually information on our water last year, our rain last year from January through November of 2022. And what you should notice is that it's highly variable. For good gardening, we need about one inch of rain per week. And quite frankly, we don't actually get that here in Northern Virginia. And so we have to supplement with additional watering. Irrigation is wonderful. Rain barrels hose, watering can are all options to think about. Part of the other reason why you will want to water as well is that when we do get rain, especially May, June, July, we will have these massive thunderstorms roll through with a lot of rain uh, in a short period of time. Much of that water doesn't have the capacity to percolate into our soil. It just washes across the surface. And so we might get two inches in one sitting but most of that is actually rushing towards our streams and our other waterways. So it's something to think about. In addition, depending on what type of garden you have will impact how much watering you might need to do. If you have a container, for example, and it's in full sun, you might need to water on a more regular basis, especially when it's uh, warm out. And you'll want to water on the early side of the day so that water, if it does accumulate on the leaves, will have time to evaporate. Water on leaves tend to lead to other types of diseases as well. Finally, our last major section for requirements is soil preparation. Getting that soil ready for your vegetable garden depends on whether or not you're working with a pre-existing garden or you're starting a brand new one. If you have a pre-existing garden, it is recommended that, of course, you apply fertilizer, but ideally have a soil test to see what makes the most sense for a vegetable garden in that location. If you're doing a new garden, there are additional steps that you'll need to pursue. So you'll need to remove any pre-existing plant. If you are removing grass, or in my case, weeds, you'll want to cover that area with newspaper or cardboard so that that material will basically die back and then you can turn it into the soil and ostensibly use it as compost. In addition, you're going to have to add soil amendments because of the type of soil we have here in Northern Virginia. You're going to need to add some topsoil. You're also going to want to add some um, organic material, compost and or manure to add both texture, but also nutrients to that soil. Fertilizer as well. And again, 
you'll want to do a soil test to figure out what makes the most sense for you. Last but certainly not least, one of our favorite things is compost. Compost is a combination of kitchen scraps from plants. Do not use dairy or meat. You can use eggshells in your kitchen compost. One of the most popular things is actually coffee grinds or tea. Those are great for compost. That can then be mixed with any sort of yard waste. So oftentimes we talk about browns and greens and mixing those together. We use compost to, of course, help facilitate the movement of air and water, but also compost releases nutrients in the soil as well. You can buy compost at a garden center, but you can also make your own. Some folks have very elaborate compost like the one here in the picture, but I actually just have a little container under my sink where I put my coffee grounds and tea bags and mix it. And once a week, I just sort of dump it in my vegetable garden. I have teenagers and that's sort of the level of composting I can get um, out of my household. Here are our major takeaways. One, get a soil test understand what it takes to create healthy soil and to think about things like air, temperature, and climate, sun, and water. All of these components are critical to your healthy soil. And now questions. And I see Ben writing stuff furiously. So I'm sure there are questions. Go ahead. We have about six or seven questions so far. Stephanie, he's a first-time gardener and is interested about the milk jug seed starting method and whether or not that works. There was a session that included information on this just a couple of weeks ago. Right. I have not done the milk jugs, but I hear from other master gardeners that it is successful and that actually Caitlin, I believe, uh, is our resident expert here on our call today who has had some success with this. I actually don't have milk jugs in my house, so uh, that is one of the deterrents, <laughs> but I would just give it a whirl and see if it works for you. I mean, Part of vegetable gardening is the adventure and experimentation, both in terms of what works for you and what, quite frankly, doesn't. Rebecca has a question on soil composition. Uh, Rebecca wants to know if it's possible to have too much compost, like food scraps or leaf matter in the in soil composition, and does that impact the plantings? So ideally for your compost, you're going to want to have it broken down to something akin to soil before you add it, because you're absolutely right that if you dump your kitchen scraps straight into your garden, there is going to be fungus and bacteria and a whole bunch of living things going on there to break down those items. And honestly, you're not necessarily going to get the nutrition from that compost at that stage. You need to sort of have it work through its own decomposition process first. So that's a great question. Yeah, Stephanie reached out. She said that she recently bought a house with an existing garden that had a, a watering system, an automatic watering system included. Um, Stephanie was hoping to know if there's any way that she can know if anything that the prior owners of the house grew in that garden that would be problematic for whatever she's seeking to plant in this coming spring. You know, I don't know how you would find that information out except maybe doing a soil test, but there are different types of soil blights that could be present that would potentially impact your plants. Absolutely. So I would definitely do something to check that out and see if there is any sort of fungus or something like that going on, but start with the soil test and see what your nutrients look like. Another question from Stephanie, can soil tests detect pesticides, especially ones that may be harmful for children? I do not believe so. Um, I have not heard of them using that for pesticide. And I, that's a great question. I don't know what tests there would be for those pesticides. One of the biggest concerns I have is some of the industrial sites that we have in this region and things like heavy metals, but also some of our older buildings where lead paint might be in use. Um, that's something to be cognizant of too. So definitely something to be concerned about. Absolutely. L. Ewing had a question about cool seasons crops and whether or not they can be directly sown or planted in the ground without starting them inside. That's a great question. It really depends on what we're talking about. Most of the time we do some direct sows, especially for our leafy greens and our peas. And most of the time I would recommend doing it outside. Our weather right now is so, we'll just call it quirky. I'm not sure when the best time to do it. So if you did want to experiment and do some stuff on the inside, I mean, give it a whirl and see how it goes. Joe wanted to know how often do you recommend doing a soil test? So I think the sort of going rate is about every three years in the least. 
But if you're first time gardener and you notice you have a lot of issues in terms of nutrients, in terms of organic matter, you might want to do it every year until you get a handle on what's going on with your soil. Amy has a question about soil preparation, specifically asking about covering an area of the ground with cardboard to essentially starve the, the weeds of light and help them to die back. Amy was hoping that you have some information about when to do this. Is, is now a good time? Now would be a great time. November would have been a great time too, <laughs> but, but now would be a great time um, to get that started. It's not ideal, but because it just depends on how long, depending on what we're talking about for it to die back. But doing it like right now, I think would be great. Eleni uh, would like to know about adding coffee grounds to help with clay soil. Does that make it too acidic for vegetables? Apparently not, because I have the most alkaline soil I've ever seen. So I actually collect coffee grounds and use that as my compost. And so I don't know what's going on with my soil. Again, a lot of this is about experimentation and see how it goes, but I've not had a problem with that. Eve Shelton was wondering if wine grapes have a different soil requirement than other types of fruits or vegetables. Uh, absolutely. That's a great question, particularly like wine grapes or orchards. All of those are going to have very different soil requirements um, and also topography. There's actually a term in French called terroir, which is taste of place. And this term is often used, it emerges with the, the wine industry and how you have to have a certain amount of lime in the soil as well as a certain angle of the sun. I mean, th that is a place where we definitely see these types of requirements at work. If anything, our vinters are our masters uh, of understanding our soil. John was also interested in if you have tips on best ways to deal with little animals from eating your vegetables, especially rabbits. <laughs> Well, Fatima is going to cover dealing with pests on Friday, but I, I hear you, John. I have a problem with squirrels poking holes in tomatoes and sucking them dry. Uh, so I've moved to cherry tomatoes. So that's one thing that I've found is more successful. But I think Fatima will have more advice on how to deal with our pests in a, in a safe way for everybody. Should some plants be, not be planted next to other plants that need uh, different soil needs? That is ideal, but honestly, you have to sort of deal with the space you have and also what you want to grow. You're going to want to space plants out anyways, because again, if they're too crowded, that can potentially lead to disease and stunt the development of your plants just writ large. So, but you might want to look at the soil requirements. Usually acid loving plants are not vegetables usually. And so those are like your azaleas and your camellias. So unless you're doing landscape gardening where you're mixing your spinach right next to an azalea bush, that might be a place where you would see that as a potential problem. But otherwise, if you're doing you know, a raised bed or containers, you should be okay. All right, I'm gonna toss this over to Fatima. Thank you, so that was great. I could sit in your class any day to <laughs> have a lot of fun and learn. Hopefully a lot of you felt like you were back in college in 101 as she was going through all the physical makeups and the pH, all important things you need in order to have a really successful garden. So now that you have everything worked out, you are a full master gardener now, you know your soil, you, you know how much rain, how much water, uh, the temperature, et cetera, that's needed to be successful. We're gonna talk about how do you plan your garden layout? What are the things you're going to choose to plant and how are you going to make those selections and what's going to be your spacing for doing that? On this particular slide, you'll see a lot of vegetables that are commonly grown in this area and that a lot of master gardeners like to grow and a lot of us like to eat. So as you look at this slide, I want you to think about of the things you like to eat, maybe identify in the top three or four, because then we're going to talk about how do you make those selections. And Ben said in the beginning that I have a plot in the city of Alexandra and Chico Pen Community Garden. In that garden, there are probably over a hundred different plots there. And if you walk around that community garden, you'll see various types of layouts. You'll see various types of 
plants that are being grown there. Anything from bitter melon to melons that look like snakes to cherry tomatoes to Cherokee tomatoes. So as you think about the numerous crops that you're going to eat, I'm going to walk you through just a couple of things that you need to take into consideration as you are making the decision. Kristen talked a little bit about spacing and also the options such as container gardens, raised beds. I'll get a little bit more into that after we talk about how do you identify of the things you like, which ones do you really want to grow and do you have the space to grow those things? So are you looking for something that's going to produce a lot of high yield or low yield? When you think about high yield, you're thinking about perhaps tomatoes, peppers, uh, eggplants, yellow squash, greens, different types of greens, different types of lettuce, such as your spinach, your kale, your mustard greens. Those things tend to grow perhaps out wide as opposed to your tomatoes and peppers that grow more in a vertical aspect. Then you can also look at your vining crops, such as your melons, your pumpkins, and your winter squash. This past season, I decided to grow spaghetti squash because I like spaghetti squash. But lo and behold, the spaghetti squash was growing all through my tomato plants and up on the fence. No matter how many times I tried to guide them, they kind of took over that area. And I probably got 10 spaghetti squash, but I only kept two for myself and I gave away the rest to other gardeners or to the food bank. We have several gardeners in our community that collect food items every Saturday to donate to the food bank. Another challenge I've had with spacing is because I'm known for just throwing seeds out and seeing what would happen as one year I planted sweet potatoes and I gave an example to spaghetti squash growing through the tomato plants. Well, the sweet potato grew through the bottom of everything that I was growing that year. So as I dug up my garden after the summer season, I had sweet potatoes everywhere of all different sizes. So it's important that you understand how plants grow, not just that you like them and you wanna eat them, but understand how many days it also takes to harvest. And when you put seeds down to be patient with that harvest. I have a friend who gardens in Maryland and for example, she never grows carrots because she says she can get them cheap in a grocery store and she'd rather spend her time on her pot growing other unique vegetables. Um, as you make those decisions as to what you wanna grow, just keep in mind, it's all an experiment. It's all fun. And it's important to do your research in addition to having fun. When we were preparing for this presentation, one of the things that came up was the difference between heirlooms, hybrids, whether or not folks should use organic, organic seeds or GM, GMOs. So at the end of the day, it's all a personal preference. But here, I just want to discuss a few differences between hybrids and heirloom seeds. When you think of hybrids, think of a cross between two different plants, and it's intentionally done. It's crossbreeding. And a primary example that tends to come up a lot is the Meyer lemon tree, which is a lemon tree in a mandarin orange, and they are mostly grow in warmer climates but that's an example of a hybrid. So the flavor may not be considered as good as the flavor for an heirloom. That's one of the main difference. So just knowing that and know that it is a personal preference and do your research before you make a decision as to what you wanna grow. Kristen talked earlier about different zones. This is a chart that's in one of your handouts and I believe Caitlin, can also put the link in the chat because it's very hard to get a clear visual of this chart. I think almost every gardener in Northern Virginia should have this chart somewhere printed out or saved on your favorites as you begin to plan your garden. It's color-coded 
the purple is showing you what you should plant, the time of year which you should plant it. And then the yellow is like across of the plant and the harvest. And then the green is when you will harvest. On next week Friday, I'll talk about harvesting and what's the proper way to harvest, the proper time of day in which to harvest. But because we are in mostly zone seven, seven A or B, we have a really, really long plant season. It's almost, I would say, from March to November. And a lot of folks are probably getting ready if they haven't done so already to start their colder weather planting, such as their beets, their carrots, their radish, their, um, their kale. And then later on planting their tomatoes, their peppers and okra. I also want you to keep in mind not planting too soon because today is like 60 degrees here, but tomorrow I believe it's gonna drop 20 degrees. So not only are the plants confused, but you don't want to get ahead of yourself and then put something out and you end up having to replant it or repurchase it if you use transplants. So this slide is basically just a summary of the previous slide. But what you should be doing right now is planning. For example, I have a notebook and every year between probably the end of December to now, I am drawing out what I want my plot to look like, what I want to plant, where I'm going to purchase my seeds. I'm doing all that planning right now. And then next month in early April, I'm starting to prepare my plot, moving all the rubbish that has accumulated there, the leaves, weeds. I heard the question earlier about weeds. I'll talk a little bit more about that next week. But a good time to pull weeds is also after the rain. So if the person who asked the question, I know it's going to rain in the next coming days. So if you want to get out there and pull weeds right after that rain, it's a good time to do so. But just remember to get down and get to the root of the weed. Don't just pull the weed off of the top of the ground or you will have weeds again. And I'll give some ideas next week about how to smush those things out. Yeah, they're the vein of my existence and my plot. Then you plant the cool weather plants I talked about. And then we have what you call the Mother's Day rule. I usually don't plant my tomato plants until after Mother's Day. I know Ben is on as one of our facilitators and a phenomenal classmate. He's a tomato guru, but that's the time I usually wait because they like it a little warmer to plant my tomato plants. And throughout June, July, and August, you should be mending your garden, watering, fertilizing, reading the directions on the fertilizer, paying attention to what needs to be fertilized, what plants need to be fertilized, not just throwing fertilizer out there and harvesting. And then the cycle starts again, you begin to plant your cool weather crops, and in the fall, you come back around and you begin to clean up and you put nourishment back into your soil with your compost, you mulch for the winter. If you are not going to do a year round garden, you can plant some cover crops that's also an option. So now that you know how to keep your soil, you've made a decision what you're gonna grow, you know the time of year in which you're going to grow it, let's talk about some various garden layouts. This particular design is just a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun based on your spacing when you begin to map out what you're going to do and you think about whether you're doing bushy, viney crops, to how you will plant it based on the season. You need to also think about, are you gonna be around for the entire season to do a year round vegetable garden or design a plot to this extent. For example, are you going to be a snowbird and you're only going to be in the Northern Virginia area during the summer months or are you going to be here year round? Are your kids home in the summer and they can participate in gardening or not? So think about your size, think about your time, think about the location, think about how the crop is grown and think about the spacing between the different vegetables that you are going to grow. How much space do they need in order to thrive and be successful? 
we talked about tomatoes just a little bit, but as you think about how your vegetable plants grow, you need to also think about the support structures that they may need. On this slide, there are different types of trellises and then the, contain, the balcony container garden to the bottom right. When you decide that you're going to plant certain crop and you've read the instructions of how wide or how tall they grow, you need to figure out if they're going to need supports. 90% of the time, I'm just going to talk about tomatoes right now, they're going to need support. You don't wait until your tomatoes are three or four feet tall to put your support structures in because I've done that before. And what ends up happening is you're fighting with the roots to get the cages in, or you are breaking a branch or two because you're trying to maneuver the branches into the cage. So as the seeds go in, so should your support structures. I usually plant peas around this time, and then I have a trellis to the back of my plot and I would also come back and plant cucumbers that grow up the same trellis. So by the time one vegetable is finished, the other vegetable is coming in. So just depending on your space, either it's your home, your apartment, your community, whether you're planting along your driveway or you're having a mixture of vegetable plants and perennials, you need to decide upfront those things so you know the type of support structure that you need to put in place so that you don't disrupt the roots or the plant overall. Okay, this is a really nice design. It's a 10 by 10 plot and it shows you how you can lay out different plants and also include some optional plants such as the marigolds, the basils, and the zinnias and how you can spread them around the garden. So based on size, let's say if you had a 20 by 20, you may want to increase certain things in that plot or a smaller plot, you would decrease the number of plants that you see in this particular design and pay particular attention to the spacing between the plants. You see the cucumber hill, the hill, and the degrees apart, and also with the peppers. And, and some of the other designs. In this particular design, I want to point out the one to the bottom right. This isn't my plot, but it's very similar to my plot with the raised beds. If you notice, the walkways are covered with mulch. So it's important to give yourself space to move around your garden, to treat the soil, to harvest your crops once you've grown them. I've been in situations where I've overplanted and I just threw down more seeds because I had seeds, you know, like hundreds of seeds come in a packet. Let's just throw down some more and try something new because you're excited. But then you have the challenge of the plants competing. And then you also have the challenge if you get a lot of harvest of how do you tiptoe around without falling into the plants themselves to harvest them because you didn't leave yourself enough space. So think about spacing, not just for the plants, but also spacing for yourself to move around to obtain your plants. I love the picture on the top with the containers because in Northern Virginia, we just don't have a lot of space. A lot of folks live in townhouses or apartments, and here's a way in which you can garden Crystal talked about this earlier when she was talking about buckets. So I also use a garden bag. The story I told you about the sweet potatoes, well, that was one year. The next year I did plant sweet potatoes again, but I planted them in a bag as opposed to planting it directly into the garden. So in a grow bag, just be careful when you are doing these things, when you're lifting them you may want to have something to lift them with because they can be very, very heavy. So either know that's where you're going to leave them for the season or be very careful. The design to the left is another well laid out plan. If you are someone that's extremely organized, you probably really, really love this design and this footage as to what you can possibly grow in a garden of this size and to this particular scale. 
So the next couple of slides, I'm just gonna briefly talk about how can you increase your yield, various opportunities for how you can increase your yield once you've completed everything we talked about so far. And hopefully you can see how starting with just mending to your soil, to making a decision of what you wanna grow, to now that I know what I'm gonna grow, I have it in the ground, but I wanna increase my yield. So what do I need to do to do that? Don and Susan are going to do a presentation later on. I highly, highly encourage you to take their course on advanced gardening where they're gonna go in depth into how to increase your yield using different methodologies. So I'll just talk briefly about some methodologies that you can use in this presentation. But if you wanna go more in depth, I encourage you to take their presentation. They're phenomenal master gardeners for years. So let's talk about companion or interplanting. So interplanting systems are those in which two or more crops are grown together for a specific amount of time. Some examples um, include marigolds and tomatoes. Because I'm in a community plot, I tend to plant a lot of marigolds randomly around my garden because we have deer in the hope of keeping them at a bay in addition to putting up a fence, which I'll talk about some on Friday. That's just one example of how that can be done. And companion plants in Conversia is rooted in a symbiotic relationship between different plants rather than specific space patterns. So these examples are to in, improve growth rigor or perhaps even enhance the flavor of a particular plant. Succession planting, I do a lot because I like greens. I like spinach, I like kale, I like mustard greens, I like Swiss chard, I like bok choy. So as long as the season permits, I would plant, let's say spinach this week, and then seven or 10 days later, I may come back and plant rows again of spinach so I could have them for a long period of time to have to eat. And recently I just got back from a trip and I had some mustard greens that I had stored because I did some succession planting with them and I was able to freeze them and have them for dinner this past Tuesday. So that's one of the benefits of succession planting and um, having vegetables for a long period of time. And I also do a lot of that interplanting too with the greens and the tomatoes. So having the greens and then coming in when it's time to plant the tomatoes in the same bed. So they kind of provide a little bit of a shade for the greens when it gets really, really hot for those cool weather greens like kale that like it a little cooler, I could have them for longer in the season because now the tomatoes have provided just a little bit of that coverage from that hot, hot Virginia sun later in the season. So everything in nature plays a role, whether it's a mutualistic relationship, a symbiotic relationship, everybody plays a role, all of us, including our insects, our plants, everything. So one of the benefits of having different types of plants in your garden is to attract insects. Not every insect is a pest. You also have insects that take care of the pests that may eat your vegetable gardens, such as the lady beetles are amongst one of the best known and most beneficial insects. There are over 400 species in North America. And both the adults and the larva of the lady beetles, they consume the aphids and your mealworms, your mites, and other soft-bodied insect pests that may cause harm to your garden. More benefit of having plants to attract insects in your garden. We have beekeepers in our community garden. So I love planting a variety of perennials throughout my plot not just to add beauty and color to my garden, but also to attract them to my garden. I have a huge uh, lavender plant and the bees love that lavender plant. 
you should also think about the role that they play in pollination. So mostly all of these plants on this slide, I have planted right before the season ended. I purchased the milkweed because I wanted to attract some of the monarch butterflies to my plot. I have verbena. I've also have different types of verbena, different colors of zinnia. And all of these provide benefit to the garden. So not only does it attract, but just planting a diverse array of native plants can increase your yield. In our handout, you'll see several different references for different things we've talked about throughout this presentation so far and what we're going to talk about next week. There are information from Virginia Tech, information from Cornell University, two great programs that address agriculture and various aspects of gardening, not just vegetable gardening. So don't feel as if you missed anything. If you didn't see any references here, we have that page, which you should have received when you registered. Just some of the takeaways, the vegetable selection. Make sure you know not just what you want to eat, but why you're choosing the vegetables that you want to grow and how they grow. Think about your space and your location. Think about the time of year. You don't want to plant your peppers in March. You don't want to plant your zucchini in November. So keep those things in mind. Think about ways you can increase your yield such as attracting insects to help with the pollination in your garden. Think about the way in which you plant to increase your yield, what you plant next to each other. And then most importantly, have fun, but do your research, have fun and do your research. Okay, so I'll pause then to see if we have any questions. Um, there was one question about uh, whether or not there's a hard and fast rule about planting the same vegetable in the same spot in your garden year over year. I've done it, but I've also rotated because I've been encouraged to rotate plants to different locations. For So usually for maybe two years, I may plant in the same area and then I rotate. I have six beds in my garden. So this year I am going to rotate where I put my tomatoes last year. And I'll, I'll just say this, I'm going to put a shameless plug in at the end of the next part, but if you are really, really passionate about Master Garden, I highly encourage you to visit our site, to sign up, to go through the training, because last year I said, I'm going to be creative. I'm going to put tomatoes in different spots in my garden. That was a nightmare. Okay. <laughs> so I would not do that again, but it's a lot of fun. You learn about what you would do, you wouldn't do, but then you learn the science and the reason behind what you should and should not do. So yes, it is encouraged that you rotate your crops and not grow them every year in the same location. Alexandra had a specific question about companion planting. She was mentioning the three sisters method of yes. uh, companion planting, which includes corn, mm -hmm. beans, and squash. Do you have yes. any experience or tips for folks who want to try that out? I haven't, but I'm very familiar with it. There's two gardeners who have a plot right behind me, I think, who have tried it. I'm very familiar with the three sisters. I'm not big on corn, so I wouldn't plant corn, but if you are, I say go for it, have fun, and then shoot us a message and let us know how it went. Absolutely. I actually tried it once, but the squirrels won't let me grow corn in my back. Haley has a question. She says that she kills everything, even cactus. Uh, she's a beginning uh, gardener and was hoping that you may have one or two recommendations for veggies that she just can't kill. Okay. Oh, that she can't kill. Try to try okra. Okay. Yeah. I grow okra. And I've grown the red and the green okra. And you see my okra grow about uh, six to seven feet. But it's one of those vegetables you have to get out there and harvest almost every day because it can grow so long that it's you can't eat it. It's not edible. 
and then trying squash or zucchini. I would suggest those three things. Sarah had a question. If you have any tips or suggestions on how to fill a large raised bed, she noted that there's a perception that you may only have to have quality material for the top six inches or so. And, and if you have any suggestions. Caitlin, I believe we may have something on our website about building beds. I'll just tell you from experience what I've done. I usually use the soil that's there. I don't build high, high beds. My beds are probably about that tall off the ground. So I use a lot of the soil that's there and I tend to buy bags of soil to mix in. And I also mix in manure. I use a lot of horse manure, at least probably once a year. We have a gentleman that delivers horse manure for us. I purchase a certain amount and I tend to mix it all in and go for broke. But I believe we may have something on our website about the building of beds. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that. I have a tall raised bed and I use some old logs at the bottom. It's a, a method called hubble culture. You just want to make sure that whatever you put in there is dried out and not fresh green wood because that could be a competition for the nutrients in the bed as it breaks down. Amy had a question about buckets. And if you have a specific type or configuration of buckets uh, that you would use, I think that we have already answered the question. Yes, you need a drainage hole in your bucket. It was a further question. A lot of folks have questions about the buckets. Folks want to know about your bucket. <laughs> the drainage yeah. hole, the dolly, and a bucket. And I'll try grow bags. I use a grow bag because I had one spot in my garden where the way the water, when it rained, came down into my plot. I wasn't successful with growing something there through direct seeds. So I put a bag there and I just filled it. I bought bags of soil. I filled it with soil. And that's the bag I grew my sweet potato in. Just that I didn't put 12 sweet potato plants in there. I put two and that was it. So that helped. And one year I didn't know what I wanted to put in there. So I threw uh, mixed green seeds in there for like a salad bowl. So I had four clocks and greens in the same bag. Heather has a question about when's the best time to add manure to your garden bag, chicken, horse, or cow manure. Um, she's heard that manure can burn plants. You need to make sure that it's aged and the person you're getting it from knows what they're doing. And I usually do it in the fall once I've shut my garden down, even if I'm going to do a year round crop this year, I didn't, but the previous two or three years, I did garden all year and I usually do it in the fall. Stacy has a question about her zucchini and squash that get really big, beautiful leaves, but they don't produce any fruit. She wants to know if that's a potentially a soil problem. Oh, that one, I don't know. Leslie, I don't know if you know the reason. I think Leslie popped in the chat that it could be a pollination issue. So a lot of those vegetables have male and female flowers. You could go ahead and try the hand pollination method. Judy has a question. If you have any preferred method for starting sweet potato slips. Been creative with that too. I kept one of my sweet potatoes and I put it in a mason jar and just some water on my window seal here. And then once it was ready with roots and everything, I took it and planted it and it worked fine. There's a lot of stuff out there online too about doing the sweet potato slips. And I suggest trying that because the company I purchased my plants from, actually, they were great, but it was just too much. You know, you could only buy them in like a dozen. You couldn't buy one or two. And he wants to know if you plant the companion flowers to help with pests in the same bucket with the veggies or are those different buckets? I've done both and I just did it for pest control and I did it just to have fun. Mm -hmm. Go a little quickly, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go quickly. This particular slide talks about um, four different ways in which you can obtain your vegetable plants. We mentioned a little bit about direct sow your seeds. So purchasing your seeds and directly planting them in the ground. You can purchase the, your plants. Just be careful when you purchase them, make sure you looked at them to make sure that they're healthy. You check the leaves below to make sure there's no diseases, make sure they're not root bound, pull them up out of the pot, check them. Okay, you can grow your own transplant. I'll talk about this just a little bit more on a couple of slides, but 
it takes a lot of time. If you're not somebody who's home and has a lot of time to put into them, I wouldn't recommend it if you're just starting out. Basically, if you're just starting out, I highly, highly suggest that you purchase plant and maybe do a mixture of that with some direct sows. If you're really creative, you've been gardening for a while and you want to grow your own transplant, there's tremendous benefit, pride in doing that volunteer plants. Last year, I had four volunteer cherry tomato plants. I didn't pull any. I was happy and sad at the same time, happy because I had cherry tomatoes all the way through the end of November and I could donate to the food bank, but sad because they just took up so much space. So these are some methods that you can use. Pay attention to the information on the seed packet. There's a wealth of information on the seed packet. If it says plant only a certain depth, usually I use the tips of my finger to determine how deep I'm going to plant things. You don't want to put them down so deep that nothing happens or so shallow that the birds take them away. So read this information carefully. Think about the spacing, the maturity, how long it takes to harvest, and be patient with what you're doing and follow those directions. If you look at the very bottom, there's a date the seed was so where you can write it down. Record stuff. Then you could go back and reflect on it the next year as to what you did and what worked and what didn't work. Also think about your neighbors and friends, and you may want to do some seed swapping with them. You buy these packs of seeds that have more seeds than you will plant in a lifetime. Maybe you buy carrots, your neighbor buys beets, and you guys share crops, or either you share seeds to grow the same crops. Here are some examples of different things that you can grow directly. I grow garlic. I usually plant those in November. I talked about the greens and the other root vegetables. So just some, some things that grow really, really nice in this area. Tips for buying transplants, just look carefully at them to make sure you're not buying diseased plants and putting diseased plants in your garden. I would say that's the biggest thing. The pros and cons of your own transplant. I think on the first slide, I talked about the time that it may take the startup costs. They were talking earlier about the different mediums, such as the milk jug. I've also seeing stuff where people use the old plastic container from rotisserie chickens or use eggshells. If you're really good at cracking that egg in half and putting the seeds in there and putting it back in the carton for it to begin the germination process. So it does take time. It does take costs. But again, it's the joy and the self-satisfaction that you did this. This is your plan and you're eating it. Garden equipment. These are some of the favorite garden equipments of the master gardeners. I'm just going to tell you, hands down, my favorite piece of equipment, well, it's two, is the garden bench on the upper right-hand corner, and then the middle with the orange little hand that's called a hari hari, which is actually Japanese for dig, dig. And I'm digging, digging, <laughs> digging, digging the plant or digging, digging to get those weeds up out of there. And then the bench, I love the bench for different reasons. You can kneel down on the bench and you can use those two handles to push yourself up. That little packet on the side, you can put your tools in there or you could flip it over, sit on it or flip it over and put that basket for harvesting on top of it and do your harvesting. So on our website also, we have some of the favorite tools of the master gardeners. But please don't go out and spend a ton of money if this is your first year of gardening. You will not need everything on this list. You know, having a shovel, something to harvest, some shears, something to water, and something to collect your harvest with. If we didn't say anything else, I want you to pay particular attention to this slide because there's no sense in having all this fun and gardening and you're not protecting yourself or being safe. So stay hydrated. By the time you start to feel dehydrated, it's too late. I keep water Gatorade pretzels with me when I'm gardening. Even if you're in your home and you're gardening in your yard, even if you don't feel thirsty, please drink some water every hour or so. Stay hydrated. Don't pick up insects with your hand. Uh, the um, Curiosity, you know what curiosity did to the cat. So please don't do that. I don't want you to get bit by something and end up in the hospital. We talked about lifting properly, lifting heavy things. Make sure you have the proper tools to lift things. Consider your own personal health and hygiene. 
as you garden, know whether or not you're sensitive to certain things. And I'll tell you, even if you're not, last year I found out, I just started breaking out because now I'm allergic to four types of weeds I've never even heard of before. So just make sure that you are taking care. So now I used to be in a garden of shorts. I'm in a garden, which I should have been doing already in long pants, long sleeves, a hat, and sunscreen. I wear sunscreen 365 days a year. Please put on your sunscreen when you're in the garden. Wear closed toe shoes and take care with your equipment. Don't lay it down on the ground then you come back and you step on it. Lean it up against a fence. Um, if I'm working with my shovel or fork or something, I stick it down in the ground as opposed to laying it down. I have bright pink gloves because I'm known for losing my gloves and my own plot. I turn around, I was like, where did I put my gloves? So just take care with your equipment and work with tools that have been sharpened. Sharp tools will help you as you garden. Okay, so protect yourself and have a lot, a lot of fun. In the beginning, Ben and Kristen talked about who we are. We're interns. We are just a part of a bigger group of master gardeners in Northern Virginia. We're interns. We were first trainees when we took this phenomenal, phenomenal course. And uh, now we're working through our intern project. The Master Gardener's purpose is to educate, encourage, and promote environmentally safe gardening practices throughout this area. Even if you're on this call and you're not from the Northern Virginia area, please research your extension offices, most likely through your university systems in your respective states or areas to plug in and become a part of it. It's a great community of folks that love just taking care of the environment, love helping each other. We also have a help desk where you can bring in samples and we can help you potentially identify things that are going wrong with your plants. We have a plant clinic that we run at several local farmer markets. And we also have demonstration gardens. It wasn't until I took this course that I even knew that there were so many demonstration gardens with and 10 to 15, 30 minutes of where I live. As an undergrad, I majored in science. I was a biology chemistry major, but coming back and taking this course and working with my classmates and my colleagues and all of our mentors it just helped bring to fruition things that I learned years ago. We won't talk about how many years ago. Um, and now that I'm practicing, that things I may have done intuitively in my life that I enjoyed just because I enjoy gardening. So it's a shameless plug. If you're interested in gardening, you want to learn more for yourself or just for the community, for the environment, please, please, please sign up to become a part of our wonderful, wonderful community. And then if you live outside of the area, here's some additional resources for you. And as I stated, all of these resources are on the handout that you should have received when you registered for this course. Okay, so takeaways. You have the four different ways of obtaining your plants. We talked about direct seed versus transplants, the pros and cons of transplanting, um, doing your own and things you should look for when you purchase. We talked about equipment, safety, and of the utmost importance and protecting yourself and having fun. Any questions? One question did come up. Sandra was interested in knowing whether leftover seeds from last year are still gonna be good for this year. Depends. So read the packet. It depends on the type of seed. Read the packet. It will tell you the length of time for the seeds it should. Mm -hmm. I've used seeds from year to year. Believe it or not, Fatima, that was the last question. So any last words from you before I wrap this up? Yay. <laughs> Thanks everyone for attending today. Next week's session will be completely different. It will build on this, but the topics will be different next week. Well, thank you for that, Fatima. Yep, we're looking forward to seeing everybody here at the same time next week for part two. Huge kudos and thanks to you both, Fatima and Kristen, for, for all of the wonderful information today. With that, have a great weekend, everybody.